We have details of all these stories and more. Do be a part of the show. Let's hear what you make of the many stories we have for you tonight. We first begin from the Upper East Region, where the Kusaw Traditional Council in the Upper East Region has banned all campaign activities by the new Patriotic Party and directed its people to refrain from same. The council, at a press conference, accused government of reneging on its responsibilities, leading to an escalation of the conflict. The council also accused government of disrespecting the chiefs and people and breaching the law by allowing a rival chief into the area. Let's now speak to our Upper East Regional Correspondent, Castro Senyala. Castro, thank you so much for joining us. How is the security situation in Boku? Right, Aisha. Boku cannot be described as hot as it was yesterday and can be said to be as relatively peaceful as it was some few months ago. This is all thanks to the joint efforts of the military and the police who have continuously mounted, uh, I mean, their operations within the municipality and across other sectors, I mean, all suburbs of uh, the Kusok area. I can report that there's some amount of, uh, I mean, movement within the town earlier in the day and later this evening. But as we speak now, the town is completely empty as people have gone into their homes because they fear there may be some sort of gunshots and they don't want to be caught in them. Castro, why has the Kusaw Traditional Council banned campaign activities of the NPP in all six constituencies? Aisha, even before the Kusaw Traditional Area, I mean, Council came out to ban the activities of the NPP, uh, you would uh, understand, or you might have heard that some uh, parliamentary candidates of the NPP themselves, I mean, announced suspension of uh, campaigns due to the volatile situation in the town. You know, uh, the Kusaw Traditional Council says that the MPP government hasn't done so much as far as containing the issue of the conflict is concerned. They are also uh, not happy that uh, they have allowed, if I say they, the government has allowed a rival chief into the Boko municipality. And for that matter, they say they are banning all activities and uh, directing, strongly directing um, uh, their people, the Kusok people, to do the same and uh, adding that they would continue to ensure that no other activity of the party is carried out in the area. Uh, I've been trying to speak to some MPP bigwigs within the region who have refused to comment on the issue, saying it's early days, but they are worried about the development and are hoping that in the coming days, uh, tensions will go down and the traditional council will, will make on its decision to allow for everyone to campaign peacefully. And then uh, when we get into elections, there won't be any sort of disturbances. Well, Castro, there's Porsche in the studio, but just before you go, we understand that the Regional Security Council also had a crunch meeting. Can you tell us about this? Right, Porsche, yes. Uh, I am getting information that, yes, uh, there hasn't been any, uh, I mean, RESEC meeting, but then uh, steps are being taken to have that meeting because they, uh, due to the escalating, uh, I mean, tensions within the town, it is, has become very necessary for the rest to sit together and deliberate on ways forward to, I mean, ensure peace. You would agree with me that uh, three months ago there was peace, and this is due to the efforts of the, the RESEC. And so they would want to sustain the engagements with the traditional authority and all other state actors and those involved in the peace-building process to ensure that peace is once more brought to Boko, especially as we head into a very crucial election in December. Castro, thank you so much for your time. And Castro Senyala is our Upper East Regional Correspondent. So Castro has painted a picture for us what's happening on the grounds in Boko and how things are playing out, what the security is doing about it. Let's engage a security analyst on this to pick his thoughts on why, once again, Boko is in the news and again for the wrong reasons. We've been joined by Dr. Victor Doko, a lecturer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center. Thank you, Doc, for your time and good evening to you. Thank you very much and good evening to you and Porsche. Uh, to start with, I mean, clearly it looks as though we are um, running around the same issue over and over again. There is an underlying political, uh, I beg your pardon, chieftaincy concern here. And uh, we've gone away, come back to it. There was relative peace. Now we are talking about this same concern again. What is it that we are not getting right in helping resolve this issue once and for all? Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot that um, stakeholders are not getting right. And when I say stakeholders, I mean the state, central government, the security services. You can talk about the 
CSOs also because they are in one way or the other related to this. Now, holistically, it is the responsibility of the state, the central government, to ensure that there is peace, whereby its citizens will be having the free movement and free, you know, human rights, you know, attributes, association, movement, and all that safety. But as it is now, the will of the central government is what is somewhat lacking with regards to commitment when it comes to sustained engagement to see that the underlying factors, yes, it's chieftains. There are approximate factors over the years that have contributed, okay, to the triggers that we have um, seen or experienced when it comes to recurrence of violence, armed violence and confrontations between the youths. Now, what actually the problem is, there hasn't been, okay, when I say there hasn't been, I mean there hasn't been an effort made to resuscitate the Boko Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee that was mandated to foresee that the factions come together and then iron out issues and then holistically declare the conflict over. That hasn't been done. Now, somewhere in 2000, there about 2002, we were looking at the issue of recommendations posed by a consortium of NGOs that happened in Kumasi. Now, to date, that recommendation hasn't been done. One of the recommendations was to have a permanent, you know, office for the Operator Olympics Committee to mm -hmm. effectively, you know, implement the, the recommendation, but it hasn't been done. Right. Now, what has caused this current disturbances is with regards to the um, February 15 incident at Narilegu where um, one said he was, you know, in his skin as a Boko Daba, right. and then subsequently his entry into Boko. Now, this you would ask, you would be rest assured that the Kusasi people in Boko would not agree to. Mm. Now, a lot of questions have come up as to how say has been able to enter Boko, and who aided say who are the stakeholders behind serious entry into Boko? There are lapses on the part of the security services. Mm. Why do I say so? You would you would expect that when the arrest warrant was issued on Seidu, there will be some sort of intelligence. What I mean is monitoring, so that the said gentleman does not enter Boko. Mm. The security services cannot tell us. The intelligence bureaus cannot tell us that they did not analyze the situation, whereby knowing that when Seidu enters Boko there will be chaos. I think they knew, but they overlooked certain things. In that case, the, the, the aspect of Seidu entering Boko means that there was an intelligence failure on the part of the intelligence bureaus and security services. Right. And how Seidu entered Boko, and now we are all seeing the consequences. Right. And, and still on that issue, I mean, it has led to the traditional authorities banning the new patriotic party from undertaking any political activity in the area. Um, how would this help in the resolution of the current challenges? Well, for one thing that I'm looking at it from the humanitarian angle is that, before I come to the political angle, is that one, the sort of um, this embargo placed on political activities affecting the NPP means that what is happening in the region, in that area, is that the MPP faction or members, okay, are the ones affected by, by that. I mean, they are the ones that could be at the end or receiving end of violence. Mm. So with this, I see it as a safety mechanism, a preventive mechanism, so that these MPP factions, those candidates who want to go about and, ca and campaign, will not be affected much. The other aspect, okay, is that the Zugwa the Bokunaba is, you know, stamping his authority as a paramount chief, okay, as an overlord, that yes, I have the power to curtail or stop political activities. Right. It's in relation to the fact that they have expressed, mm. okay, they have expressed their concerns with regards to government's inability to address certain issues, okay. including allowing Seydou to come in. Okay. So it is all one when you analyze it well, you would know that, yes, I'm stamping my authority as an overlord. Since you failed to do A, B, and C, then I would not allow your people to campaign effectively.
Right. And, and it's interesting the two ways you look at it, both as a security measure and also a preventive measure. But uh, talking about prevention, we've just picked up some information that there seem to be some kind of a spread of that particular development in Ashaiman or some other parts of uh, the country where we have indigents from the Boku enclave or within the Boku area staying out of the area. We are told that it seems to be degenerating or getting warmer and hotter in other parts of the country. How can we prevent this from, you know, de-escalating? Very so. Now, what is happening is, 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 is what we term the spiral effect of, you know, a conflict in one area, which is happening elsewhere, far away from the main center of, of engagement. Now, how we can prevent is, I think the state's security knows Right, or should know where all these indigents, the Kusasi and Mampusis, are inhabited in the part of Accra, Ashama, um, Tema, and part of um, the Onion Market in the part of Central Accra. Mm. Now, you can deploy, you can deploy the police services over there, okay, and then you enhance your intelligence activities over there. Okay. There are leaders with regards to these two ethnic groups there. You engage them, and then preach peace calm okay other than that then you are sure that whatever is happening in Boko mm. would definitely happen in these areas mm. dr victor docker thank you so much for your time and thoughts and expertise on this issue he's a security analyst and uh, has been speaking on the recent development in Boko, which has been an age-old concern to not just civil society but then the government and other Ghanaians in general. So let's take you through why this has become such a big deal and why we need to ensure that we de-escalate whatever tensions are building up. So um, as of November 2021 or since November 2021, over 200 fatalities have been recorded following the conflict in Boko. Five people have lost their lives in gun-related clashes. Uh, that happened in February 2024. More than 15 fatalities have been reported in recent developments. There's also been a long-standing chieftaincy dispute between the Kusasis and the Mamprusis, which has generated this current confusion. The influx of sophisticated arms, including AK-47s and G3 rifles, likely smuggled into the country from Burkina Faso is also very concerning, especially that we are in an election year. And then also there's a suspected terrorist activities exacerbating the conflict. And if the security agencies do not immediately nip it in the bud, it could become very worrisome. The implications of what's happening, over 1,000 people have been displaced to nearby towns such as Bolgatanga, Navrongo, and Sandema, increasing the pressure on local resources. There's widespread business closures and high unemployment rate due to the instability in the region. And you'd also know that uh, as we speak, 27 maternal deaths have been reported between 2021 and 2022 due to the restricted healthcare access. 246 teachers have requested transfers from between 2021 and 2023 from the conflict area which has also contributed to low school attendance. And it is uh, pretty unfortunate that this has also affected the resources of the Ghana military and the security services because over 500 soldiers have been deployed. And this has really stretched government's resources to meet the security requirements in the area. In more news tonight, the United States of America has decided not to give a visa to politicians or persons who will foment trouble and then leave the shores of the country to escape violence. The warning ahead of the December 7 elections was issued as a way of safeguarding Ghana's democracy. In a statement by the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, the caution reads in part that the United States is committed to supporting and advancing democracy in Ghana and the world over. 
The Department of State is announcing a new visa restriction policy that will restrict U.S. visas for any individual responsible for undermining democracy in Ghana. This policy will take effect in advance of Ghana's presidential and parliamentary elections scheduled to take place on December 7, 2024. The policy would apply only to specific individuals who undermine democracy and is not directed at the Ghanaian people nor the government of Ghana. Ghana has achieved three decades of democratic elections and the peaceful transfer of power between parties, a record to be proud of and a model to cherish. The U.S. readiness to impose visa restrictions if circumstances were warrant is an example of their support for the aspirations of all Ghanaians for a peaceful, transparent and credible electoral process. All right, so watching News 360 on TV3, let's go on to some other stories now. And former majority leader Osei Chaimen Sabonsu says leadership in parliament will have to engage the speaker, Alban Sumana Bagbin, to resolve the current controversy that led to the speaker adjourning the house indefinitely. The Swami member of parliament says even though the uh, he disagrees with the speaker's ruling, which led to the four seats being declared vacant, consensus building is necessary in this issue. He spoke to Evelyn Tingma in an interview. The petition that came from Haruna, uh, I understand, was lodged with the speaker. Now, by our standing orders, if a petition is lodged, the member shepherding the petition will be given space to articulate or give vent to the petition. He gives it to the speaker. And the speaker, on account of that, will provide space to that member to articulate the content of the petition. Thereafter, the speaker then uh, refers the petition to the petitions committee to study and report to parliament. After the report is submitted, then the house could uh, discuss it, interrogate it, or debate it, and soon from which if it becomes necessary and the speaker has to give a, a ruling, perhaps that could be done, or a directive that could be done. It's not being ventilated on the floor of the house. He commended the speaker for adjourning the house on the day. We saw uh, some pedestrianism creeping into parliament. And so what he did cured the mischief of the house, degenerating into something else. So on that score, and I also looked at his countenance. Uh, I, I agreed with the adjournment. I thought that the adjournment was going to be perhaps for the day. And then maybe invite the leadership to further discuss the way forward. But to adjourn Sinidi is what I have a problem with. He says major national issues have to be addressed. And so a recall is needed. We all have our egos. Here we have a speaker who has made a determination and then the supreme court tells him steal your hand we are injuncting the execution of the ruling i mean he's human so maybe he reacts in, in 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 a different manner which is what he did beyond that maybe we need to to engage In a related development, first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joe Osewusu, says he is disappointed by the turn of events in Parliament. He has admonished leadership to amicably settle the ampers to allow parliamentary business to resume. In a soon-to-air episode of Hot Issues with Kemini Amano, the Bekwai MP says youthful exuberance is partly responsible for the current situation. The politics of today, of the things that we place emphasis on, of things that, in my view, should be in the background, mm. of things that do not add any value to our work as MPs. I'm, 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 I'm disappointed. Mm. I think that those are not the things that should take the front stage when we're discussing parliament. parliament. Mm. And you're disappointed as in it doesn't matter who is on the majority side and who is not? It does. It does. But why are we um, behaving as we're doing when in the past, in the previous three parliaments I've been in, such matters are discussed in indoors, at the leadership level. Mm. 
how it's now playing out in the open. With whipping members to be agitated and showing off their machoism. What will that what what value does that serve? What or who could be responsible for that? I'm not interested in what or who. It is reflecting badly on Parliament. Mm. What we should do is as for having controversy, it has always been with Parliament. The reason Parliament is called Parliament because it's a reflection of the various shades of ideas mm -hmm. in the country. And it is expected, it is natural that members of Parliament will often disagree. Is what we see today uh, a failure on leadership or of leadership? Well, I do not intend to make any value judgment on leadership, but for me, we are moving away from the values of Parliament. How Parliament had run over the years. Um, we are demonstrating the worst part of us. Even in the past, there have always been significant differences between the minority and the majority. It is this time that we have almost, almost equal members. That's the worst part of us is manifesting. So you'd uh, have to just keep your fingers crossed. Uh, the full interview will be on Sunday at 2 p.m. with Kemeni Amano. Away from that to one of our headline stories this evening, parents are growing anxious as this year's placement for senior high schools is delayed with first-year students expected to report on Wednesday the 30th of October. Even more prospective students are uncertain about their high school destinations barely two days to reopening. The frustration on the faces of parents and their wards are telling, but the Ghana Education Service is yet to address the situation. This is the Makula Market, a vibrant commercial hub with a bustling energy. Thousands of traders, customers and porters navigate the crowded pathways. As the new academic year beckons, parents have started flocking the market to stock up essentials. But they still don't know when the senior high school placement will be released, even though students are to report on Wednesday, October 30th. Yeah, yeah, single parents say, Ban is I am much free and pa. Bibini and my own intent and them. When things go this way, the single parents struggle to make ends meet. Now, Kobu Bosu Maya, Emma, Niaman Koye Maya. We say, any boy say, one five in one fifty cities. I see. Now, we say, three hundred cities. Wow, interesting. And a trunk way, so one eight, one eight. Oh, I see, I see, one eighty cities. Right. I don't, I don't have a child yet, and I'm not here to buy any of these items, but what is assured is that cost of these items keeps skyrocketing. Parents are worried sick, and they fear the future of their children are hanging in balance as it stands. They want the release of the SHS placement done as soon as possible. <laughs> Yes, because it puts us under pressure because your child will not be placed early for you to make adequate preparations. Prospectors in a day, it's me ban temna sem kolano, omu who squa, omu bekwa, ebia, one week and two weeks time. Maybe a ska will be a awo for number kope. The Education Ministry has announced free access to the 2024-2025 SHS and TVET placement result, but thousands of junior high school graduates are anxious. Since its inception, the computerized school selection and placement system for SHS has encountered difficulties each year. GES expects that this year might see some improved efficiency. Some parents would not rush in purchasing items. two days, so buy a bema buy or buy any so basha singlet. Oh, go be you so tau. In this any man getting getting it, you wait me out to any day compose Attempt to get official responses from the Ghana Education Service at the time of filing this report failed. Meanwhile, this reopening date aims to ensure that the school calendar starts in September next year to pave way for final year students to write their 2025-2026 WASI in May June. Christian Yale, TV3 News, Accra. 
This is your election command center. The flag bearer of the NDC is asking factions in the Boku conflict to exercise restraints and not escalate the conflict to innocent individuals. John Mahama is campaigning in the northern region and says his next administration will work assiduously to de-escalate the conflict and bring feuding parties together for lasting peace and development. A report by Komla Kunche. In the last few days, sporadic gunshots unabated with some reported casualties. Local security in the Boku enclave have reported some dead. There has been disappointment from political actors who have been calling out each other. The flag bearer of the NDC is equally disappointed. Unfortunately, any time the peace of Ghana will be disturbed, it is the MPP government that is in power. Recently, I've been hearing some things happen, happening in Boko that appear to be threatening to disturb the peace there. I just appeal to the people of Boko area and all those who are stakeholders in what is happening there to exercise patience, exercise restraint. We know that there are some sinister hands who are trying to stoke the fires of ethnic conflict. They should not allow themselves to be provoked to violence. And so please, the people of Boko area, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, remain calm. NDC is coming. When we come, we will make sure there's peace in Boko. On day one of his northern regional campaign, John Mahama was in Cherponi in the northeast region, where the chiefs expressed dismay at government over the neglect of their roads. His entourage then moved to Saboba. With 40 days to the elections, the unwavering crowd massed up to show their support and resolve to give in the NDC and John Mahama a resounding victory. For John Mahama, the bane of Ghana's current wars is a lack of a truthful leadership that has eluded the country in the past eight years. He wondered where Kanda and honesty has been placed by official dome. Unfortunately, the current crop of leaders we have, Nana Akufado and Baumia, you cannot trust anything they say. And as ABA Fusheni said, and I'll pay the copyright for this, he said, if they greet you in the morning, look at the sun before you answer. That's uh, former President John Dramani Mahama, who is the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. We have some news just coming in regarding Boko, where the Ministry of um, the Interior has placed a 6 to 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I beg your pardon, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew on the Boko municipality. Let me just take you through some very brief portions of it. It says, following an emergency national security meeting held today under the chairmanship of President of the Republic, Nana Kufado himself, Government wishes to inform the general public of the following. The return to Boko on 24th of uh, October 2024 of Mr. Seydou Abagre was illegally, who was illegally enskinned as Boko Naba in February 2023, subsequent to the vacation by the Court of Appeal sitting in Kumasi of the warrant for his arrest has led to significant disturbances affecting public peace and security in the area. Unfortunately, these disturbances have resulted in the loss of numerous lives in Boko and its environs with a looming threat of escalation beyond Boko. Based on assessment by national security agencies, the continued presence of Mr. Seydou Abagri in Boko poses a substantial threat to public safety and security. In light of the foregoing, pursuant to the provisions of the Public Order Act 1994, Act 491, a curfew is hereby imposed on Boko from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., commencing today, Monday, the 28th of October, 2024, until further notice. And it says government is monitoring the situation. It is signed by Nana a year, Member of Parliament, Deputy Minister for the Interior, on behalf of the Minister. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Welcome back to News 360. Let's do business now. And the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of G7 Security Systems, Mark Rubin Kuma, has assured clients and stakeholders of the company's commitment to providing the highest level of security. 
Speaking during the company's staff deba, the managing director outlined some measures being implemented to ensure client security. G7 Security Systems has distinguished itself as one of the leading private security companies in Ghana and beyond. The recent DEBA brought together clients, staff and security agencies to educate and award outstanding staff members recognized for their excellence in various categories. Speaking to the media, the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of G7 Security Systems outlined key security measures implemented to ensure best practices among its members. We we'll create cells of personnel at various points and locations uh, to serve as a backup force for the people who are on the field so that in case there is a trigger they can go and then create a reinforcement. The other one also is that our control room normally will operate 24 hours uh, to pick up signals and then uh, give the same information to the field to operate on. He further assured clients of the company's commitment to providing and maintaining high standards of robust security. We give them the assurance that we will do our possible best to uh, maintain our high standard of service delivery uh, by ensuring that their investment is intact because we will give them the necessary security that will ensure that they are well protected at home, at workplaces and all the, wherever they, are, they have our men. Over the years, G7 Security Systems has delivered modern security solutions to clients and the general public, demonstrating a strong sense of urgency and commitment to detail. In more business news this evening, the convener of the Media Coalition Against Galamse, engineer Dr. Ken Ashigbe, has warned that the ongoing Galamse activities could lead to future restrictions on, cocos, uh, on Ghana's cocoa exports if not checked. Speaking to three business at the 2024 Africa Water Week, he highlighted the significant negative impact of Galamse on the economy. The Africa Water Week serves as a high-level political platform where governments, regional institutions, international partners, the private sector, civil society and media from across the continent convene to address water and sanitation challenges. In a commemoration press engagement, Dr. Kenneth Ashigbe stressed the future impact of the Galamse menace on Ghana's cocoa exports. Even our cocoa that is supposed to be premium globally, we're beginning to target in such a way that it would be at risk. And we know that the Chinese are a major factor when it comes to this. The Chinese have started producing cocoa. So they are coming here and working together with us and destroying our cocoa whilst they are producing, you know, the cocoa. He further advocated for alternative economic uses of Ghana's land and water resources. If you take an acre of land and you farm avocados on it, within the next four years, you will start harvesting and earning between five to seven thousand dollars a year for the next 30 to 50 years. If you take coconut, for example, coconut after the third, fourth year will start giving you two thousand five hundred dollars. Then when you take a, 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 that same acre of land and you do galamse on it, you get six thousand dollars. After the six thousand dollars, that land is gone. The press engagement was organized by Revenue Mobilization Africa, a member of the Tax Justice Network Africa, and a host of the Water Citizens Network campaign in Ghana. That's it for business on News 360. Stay with us. We have sports right after this. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Oriko Ampofo. We head straight to France where Manchester City midfielder Rodri is the leading contender to win the 2024 Ballon d'Or award after an impressive season for his club and country. Rodri clinched the Premier League title with the Citizens last season as well as he went in the 2024 European Championship with Spain. The defensive midfielder managed to score 12 goals and provided 14 assists for club and country, winning four trophies in the process.
We still stay in France because there's African interest as Nigeria's Ademola Lukman secured a 14th place finish in the 2024 Ballon d'Or rankings ahead of the official ceremony tonight in Paris. Lukman's remarkable season with Atalanta and him that prestigious nomination as part of the top 30 best footballers in the world. He was instrumental in their UEFA Europa League victory, netting a hat-trick in the final against Bayer Leverkusen to deliver Atalanta's first ever European trophy. He wrapped up the season with 11 goals and 7 assists in 31 league appearances, earning him the Club's Player of the Year award on the international scene. He also helped Nigeria reach the final of the Africa Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast. From France, let's head to England, where Manchester United have sacked manager Eric Ten Hag following the club's poor start to the season. Ten Hag's final game was Sunday's 2-1 defeat at West Ham that left the club 14th in the Premier League with just three wins from their opening nine matches. United are also 21st of 36 teams uh, in the Europa League table, having drawn their three opening games. Ruud van Nistelrooy who joined the club as Ten Hag's assistant last summer, has been named as the interim manager. You can get some more sports stories on our social media handles at 3 Sports GH, especially updates on the ongoing Ballon d'Or Awards in Paris. My name is Aurel Kwampofu, and that wraps up the sports segment here on News 360. At least 40 Chadian soldiers have been killed after their base was attacked Sunday evening. President Mohamed Derby has ordered a counter mission to track down the culprits, according to a statement from his office. The attack reportedly happened on an island called Bakaram in a vast marshy region that was once covered by the waters of Lake Chad before its dramatic shrinking in recent decades. No suspects for Sunday's attack are named in the presidency statement, but the areas close to the border zones of Nigeria and Niger, where Islamist militants are known to operate. U.S. President Joe Biden has voted early in the presidential election, with just over a week to go before polling day. The president, who dropped his re-election bid in July, has appeared at an early voting site in his home state of Delaware, where he was seen waiting in a queue that extended outside the polling station. After casting his ballot, he was asked by reporters about Elon Musk's daily one million cash giveaway, which he described as totally inappropriate. Well, we're getting used to it. That's why the selection is so important. You know, most of the presidential scholars I've spoken to talk about the single most consequential thing about a president's character. Character. And, uh... Well, that's how we bring the bulletin to an end. Thank you so much for watching. I am Martin Esiedudate, and I've been here with... Portia Gabo. And at 9 p.m., do make a date with... Um, Beatrice Edu, she has a fine lineup of gentlemen who will be discussing some very nas important national issues on agenda. It's 9 p.m. on TV3. Do make a day.